Amen. Thank you, Pat. It was lovely. Have you ever uh, considered what the Bible does or what God does to powerful mindsets that humans have? And I think one of the most powerful mindsets that the Bible addresses and addresses many, many times is the concept of first and last. The human mindset says that first was best. And I think it goes to being, um, I, I, I guess, a healthy obsession with pioneers. We're fascinated with pioneers. We're fascinated with people that invent things. We are obsessed with firsts. And usually it's the first that gets all of the press and all of the glory. Only weird astronaut nuts can tell you the crew of Apollo 12. I can. Sometimes first define what a product is or what it's called, what it becomes known as. My example is the jacuzzi. We moved into a house in 1993, 1993, and it had an actual jacuzzi, not a hot tub that you called a jacuzzi. It was an actual jacuzzi, and it broke, and I couldn't find parts for it because they said that jacuzzi wasn't even in the top 20 of brands of hot tubs anymore. When I was younger, you could order a Coke in a restaurant even if they served RC or Pepsi because a Coke was a soda. We even have a perception with first or before that sticks, even though the reality is is that many products have had it passed in quality. Bausch and Lam invented the contact lens, but if you go and look as to what's available now, I'm not even sure that Bausch and Lam even make contact lenses anymore. Louisville Slugger thought that aluminum bats would be a fad, and when they finally decided to get in the game, it had passed them by. The greatest is the least. The last will be first. See, John has to help us then. The second generation has these perceptions that first is best, that first is, is always, and that first will always be that way. The first generation understands that. They know that. They, the first generation comes along and says, we touched, we were the first. We touched, we saw, we heard. And John is trying to break through that for us because he needs to break through a very powerful human perception that we all have that first is best. So when the prologue continues of of John, what does it tell us right off the bat about Jesus? Concerned primarily with who Jesus is and where he came from about where we left off last week. The word, the word was before the beginning and the word will will be after the end. He became flesh is what we mainly looked at last week. And it it concludes, uh, that part of the prologue actually concludes in verse 18 where it says, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son who is close to the father's heart who has made him known. Monogenes, one generation, if you will, one set of genetic material, God the only son, literally. One translation, it shouldn't be, is only begotten, and we'll talk about that when we get to chapter three. But then the prologue turns from Jesus to who Jesus calls, and when we begin with the very first disciples that Jesus called, who was Jesus' first disciple? Most of us think that it was Andrew, but actually it wasn't. Jesus' very first disciple was a man named John the Baptist. Now, it's very confusing because I'm going to be talking about John who wrote his gospel, which is what we're studying, and now to talk about John the Baptist. So if you get confused, you just gotta let me know. I'm trying to say the Baptist every time, but in my notes it just says John. So I'll try to say the Baptist when I'm referring to the Baptist, and I'll say John when I'm referring to the author and revelator of this gospel, if you will. But how can John follow if he came before? See? 
He was the first disciple. He was Jesus' first disciple, but he was born before Jesus. He was older than Jesus. He got called to his ministry before Jesus ever got called to his ministry because John's ministry was to prepare a path. Okay, But how can he, that's what the question might be then. How can he be a follower if he was first? It's a good question. And John answers it. The revelator answers it. The gospel writer answers it. This is he of whom I'm said, John the Baptist speaking, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remains is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. See, John had to answer the question right off the bat, because I guarantee you, John's disciples, the Baptist's disciples, had that question immediately. How can this guy, how can this guy have come first, John? You came first. And a lot of his disciples would be saying, that's why we're following you. You were first. The Bible tells us that the Baptist had disciples and the very first disciple of Jesus was John the Baptist. Now you'll find John the Baptist portrayed much differently as with others in the Gospel of John than you do anywhere else in the Bible. The only thing said of the Baptist that all four Gospels report of the same is that he is the voice crying out in the wilderness. John uh, will actually say that to us. He says um, that he, in, in verse 23, he said, I am the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. So John quotes the scripture reading from Isaiah that Mike read to us. Make way the way of the Lord. He's supposed to be the one. In others, John the Baptist is referred to such titles as Elijah of the end time. He has this, this title of being Elijah. In Matthew, oops, sorry. In Matthew 17, it says, but I tell you that Elijah, Jesus speaking, I tell you that Elijah has already come. They didn't recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the son of man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about who? about John the Baptist. He's not talking about Elijah. He's talking about an Elijah-like figure, one who who preaches in the wilderness. And he fulfills a prophecy by Malachi that says, lo, I'll send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So we know that that, that Jesus fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah. John fulfills the prophecy. John the Baptist fulfills the prophecy In Malachi, this is going to be a long day. The Baptist, if you will. He's also described as the messenger who is to go before the Lord. Because Malachi says, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And they asked John, what then are you, Elijah? See, they're expecting Elijah. Elijah. They're expecting that John has something messianic, uh, the Baptist has something messianic about him. So anybody that shows up first with a message that that the Baptist has, he's immediately asked if he's Elijah. And he says, I'm not. John's not even sure. The Baptist isn't even sure who he is. I mean, he knows who he is. He knows what he's there to preach. That's what I love about it. Are you, the, are, are you Elijah? No. Uh, get used to this, by the way, because anybody that showed up in Jesus' day that claimed to have a message from God, this would be the three questions that they would be asked. They're expecting Elijah to come first. They're expecting the prophet to come after that. And after that comes then the Messiah. We'll see this progression over and over in the Gospel of John. So they asked John, they asked the Baptist flat out, Are you? And he says, no. Are you the prophet? And he says, no. And they said to him, who are you then? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And what he said was, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. Jesus said that this is him and he's also Elijah. 
from Malachi. He's this messenger from Isaiah, and he's also Elijah from Malachi. But the Gospel of John, for some reason, seems to want to diminish the Baptist's role. Here he's described only as the voice, and he even denies right here that he's Elijah. They asked him, wait then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So what happens in the Gospel of John is that John tends to decrease, if you will, and, and we'll talk about this when we get to chapter three. Actually, we won't, because I already preached on chapter three about, the gospel of, about John the Baptist uh, this summer. But anyway, but there is a chapter in chapter three where John comes across again, and he tells his disciples, he must increase, Jesus must increase, I must decrease. The gospel of John is the only place that that is the only uh, uh, gospel where that takes place. Where the Baptist titles tend to decrease, Jesus titles tend to go up. In verse 1, he he flat out calls him God. In verse 8, he's the light. In verse 18, God the only son. Verse 29, he's the lamb of God. Verse 38, he's a rabbi. Verse 41, he's Messiah. Verse 49, king of all Israel. Verse 51, son of man. So the gospel writer is trying to do something with the gospel, with uh, the Baptist's titles and with his prominence. Why? Because he's first. He's first. And you have to begin to imagine if nearly 100 years later, John is writing this and saying that I've got to do something about this, you've got to wonder because Maybe there are a lot of people holding on to that first is best perception, that first is best concept. So the Gospel of John describes the Baptist in the most humble of terms. In verse 27, John, the Baptist will say, the one who is coming after me, I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. And then in ver- the verse that I mentioned, he must increase and I must what? I must decrease. The way we look at this is to say that this is always the perfect Christian response to the infinite humiliation of Jesus in his becoming man and dying on a cross for you and me. When we ponder what Jesus, who he is, what he has done, what he does, what he will do, shouldn't this be our reaction right here? That humility right there. And when we begin to look at, at, at uh, what John is, is trying to get across to us, to the Baptist, I would say that he's speaking to us directly, especially today. As I told you, I think in this past year, I really, really do not see a whole lot of humility in a lot of Christians trying to tell the world what's going on right now. I see a whole lot of I, 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 and me, 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 I know, You should know. I know more than you. And the humility of the Baptist should show us something. John describes the humility of the Baptist. But it might have another purpose, too, in the Gospel of John. Sometimes we modern readers get the idea that the Baptist showed up out of nowhere, which, by the way, he did. As a matter of fact, there's a a tale uh, from the... Um, their, their, their name just flew right out of my head, so maybe I'm not even supposed to use this I- illustration. But uh, the, the, the Dead Sea Scroll people, the people that were living out in the desert waiting for, for uh, the, ba- not, not waiting for the Baptist, but waiting for the Messiah. Oh, what was their name? I forgot their name. Anyway, it's the people that wrote down the Dead Sea Scrolls <laughs> when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was this group living out in the desert that were try, was trying to bring about the Messiah by reforming all of Israel. Okay? And in part of, of, of the scrolls, there's this story that this man just wandered in one day. He just wandered in, he hung out with them for a little while, and then he was gone. And a lot of Christian scholars are thinking that this possibly was the Baptist. 
Because remember, he comes out of the wilderness. He's a voice crying in the wilderness. And he literally was out there in the wilderness and then begins to make his way a little closer to civilization until he finds a place in the Jordan where he begins to baptize. And pretty soon then his, his reputation begins to spread. But it's interesting, this, this uh, stranger that just shows up in this community one day, hangs out with him for a little while, and then disappears the way that they describe him. Sounds a lot like the Baptist. And sometimes we think that that's how he interacted with Jesus and his ministry. He showed up out of nowhere, he baptized Jesus, and then he fades off into history. But looking at history, looking at just what the Bible says itself, the Baptist and the movement of those who followed him seems to have their own movement quite independent of Jesus. Look at what scripture tells us about this. How many of John's disciples followed Jesus, at least initially? Very, very few. In verse 37, it says, the two disciples heard John say this, and they followed Jesus. So in the beginning, how many? Two, okay? And one of those went and found his brother, right? One of those went and found his brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated as anointed. So now we're up to three. Three whole disciples from John's movement who've decided that they want to follow Jesus. In John chapter 3, what what I was uh, talking about that he must increase, that whole narrative about John, that's, that's a little while later, and John still has disciples. John the Baptist. The Baptist still has disciples. They are out there. That's, see, that's what gets Jesus' at, uh, disciples' attention. Master, that, that, that other guy is still out there baptizing. Him and his disciples are still out there baptizing. Imagine that. John still has followers. He still has disciples, even in John chapter 3. There's a good flow of water, and it was before he was thrown into prison, the gospel tells us. And then in verse 25 of chapter, whoops, I'm going backwards. I'm <laughs> not with it today. And then in verse 25, it says, now a discussion about purification arose between who? John's disciples and a Jew. John's disciple. He still has disciples. When John gets thrown into prison, according to Matthew, when John, when John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by, he still has disciples. Even though he's told them, I'm not the Messiah. Even though he's told them, this guy is the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase, I must decrease. Even the guy is telling those guys that he is not the Messiah and yet he can't shake what? He can't shake his disciples. He can't shake his followers. He still has them. So the disciples, of course, they go to Jesus and says, are you the one who is to come? So the question is as much for them as it is for the Baptist, right? Or are we to wait for another? According to these, John still has disciples well into Jesus' public ministry, well into the time that he was baptized, anointed, begins his public ministry. John still has disciples, If you want to look at it a little further, you can turn to Acts 18. You remember we meet this this evangelist named Apollos in Acts 18. There came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well-versed in the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with burning enthusiasm, taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Apollos is a follower of John the Baptist, and he lived all the way in Egypt. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Prisca and Aquila heard him, they took him aside, explained the way of God more accurately. And what happened after that was, was they found out he only had the baptism of John, he was baptized into Jesus, and he becomes Paul's right-hand man. In Acts 19, there are 12 men that they meet in Ephesus. 12. Interesting, right? A group of 12. 
Into what were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I wonder about these 12 guys. I wonder about that number. Why 12? Why are these 12 guys walking around thinking they found what? And notice Paul had to tell them, look, you have to believe in the one that comes after. He's not best because he's first. He's not Messiah because he came first. Dr. Uh, John Pauline in his Bible Amplifier book on John tells us that there's a little group primarily located in southern Iraq today called the Mandeans. They trace their religious heritage not back to Muhammad, not back to Jesus, but guess who? John the Baptist. He still has disciples today. You know, there might be evidence that those who were attracted to the Baptist in the wilderness may have even grown hostile to the first Christians. Why? Remember, John was martyred by a political puppet of Rome, Herod. John's disciples would then find common cause with zealots and may have sided with them in, with the, in the great war with Rome. You remember, Jesus' disciples wouldn't take part in that. So it seems incredible to us that a follower of John the Baptist would fail to grasp the superiority of Jesus, but it happened, and it shouldn't surprise us at all. I think there's a, quite a few reasons, but the simplest reason, the one that, that, that continues to come, the one that I relate to the most is simply John came first. And the old paths are always preferred. When it comes time to make change in the church, what is our rallying cry? But we've always done it this way. Jesus even used this principle in answering a question about divorce being lawful in Matthew 19, remember? When he said that I, I don't allow divorce except for, uh, except for the breaking of the marriage vow, if you will, the breaking of fidelity. And somebody said, hey, but well, hold on, that's not the way we've always done it. Moses said, and again, Moses came first, right? Right? One of the hardest problems, hardest times that Jesus is going to have in studying him in this entire gospel is dealing with the people who think that those that came first are best. And by the way, it's one of the things that gets him crucified because they believe that he came to disrupt and to wipe out the law of who? Of Moses. So since John came first, many Jews would just assume that he was greater. John answered this himself, didn't he? He said in verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me. Because he was what? Because he was before me. I understand. I really do. You know, I've, I've been on this path for a while. You all have been on this path longer than I have. And you know the pull between what feels right and what feels intuitive and to have that disrupted. By the way, we're all feeling that right now. Because if there is one thing that happened last February is everything old got what? It got disrupted. Our old way of worship, our old way of fellowship, our old way of life as believers, got completely disrupted. And what are we looking for? We can be honest, right? We want it back, don't we? We want to get back to what? We want to get back to normal. But I'm here to say that as believers in Christ, very rarely, at least in these examples, do I hear Jesus ever saying, go back to what? <laughs> when actually what he's saying is, let's go. And I've told you before, I don't know what's coming. I don't know if we'll ever go back. So there are two things that we can do then. 
If what we feel is intuitive and right, we can continue to fight. We could actually even look at it and call it something it's not so that we could fight against it. We can create enemies out of it. And unfortunately, if we do, we'll be left behind. I imagine those people that are still following John the Baptist. Here they're looking for a Messiah that John told them that he absolutely was not and they're following the voice that made the way clear and the, 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 the one that the voice made the way clear of has been here and gone for 2,000 years. So I know what it feels like. But think about it. Hasn't God been trying to disrupt this ever since he began to deal with his people, ever since he began to deal with his children? Yeah. With Abraham himself, he promises him, you and your seed shall remain forever. It be, be, because of you, there will be how many, how many descendants? You, you won't be able to count them, okay? And Abraham says, yeah, I could see that. I could see that happening. Ishmael could do that for me. Ishmael came first. Right? Even Abraham makes that argument. God says, no, not Ishmael. Who? Isaac. The one who came what? Second. Jacob and Esau. Joseph and Benjamin and his older brothers, their older brothers. David being the youngest. Bethlehem being the smallest in all of Judah. Israel being the least. I love the, 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 the statement of faith of Israel in Deuteronomy when they say, why, why did God choose you? Moses is, is telling Israel, why did God choose you? It wasn't because we were the greatest. It wasn't because we were the biggest. He said, as a matter of fact, we're among the least of all the peoples on earth. Why? Because God loved you. For some reason, God loved you. Jesus saying, the least is the greatest, the first is the last. And these teachings actually, I believe, and no, I didn't, I didn't feel this way at first, and it didn't happen overnight, but we've been living with this for nearly a year now, but what it should do is leave us open, leave us thinking, not stuck, if you will, not stuck with the old ways and the intuitive paths. Because the old ways and the intuitive paths actually could get us following the voice in the wilderness rather than the one who already came. So to me, Jesus' teaching about John the Baptist, John's teaching about John the Baptist, it should leave us open and ready to move forward rather than to move back. And it leaves us assured that no matter what is going on, he is with us through the changes. And we don't have any older brother saying, he's not with you, you're the younger one. He's not with you, we, he's with the ones that came first. Of all the lessons that our passage teaches us is we learn an extremely important lesson from the Baptist movement. How did it start? Did John start his movement? Did John the Baptist actually start his own movement? No. No. In fact, his mom was too old to have him, right? She was up there. She'd never had a baby. Miraculous birth, raised by God himself, taken out into the wilderness and told, this is what your ministry is going to be. I'll let you know when it's going to happen. And he roams around and roams around until finally God says, all right, go find some water and start. John didn't start that, did he? But even though God is involved in the founding of the movement, that same movement can later turn against God and turn against his true people. No matter how close our relationship with God as individuals or as a corporate body may be, we must constantly, constantly, have the humility and the self-awareness that the Baptist had. Imagine what happened if John believed his own press clippings. I mean, he even told them, 
exactly who they should be following, pointed it out, pointing it out to him. He's right there, okay, right there. Only two of his disciples get up to go follow him. Can you imagine if John had believed what everyone else believes about him, if he would have believed it, how powerful a movement could he have started and continued? But no matter how successful his movement would have become, he still isn't the Messiah. I don't know. Maybe I'm reaching, but that's what this teaches me. What are we willing to let go of to continue to be believers? What are we willing to let go of to continue to be worshipers? Because I don't know what's coming. Right now, we're, we're, we're worshiping like this in anticipation that something may come back. What if it doesn't? What do we do? I think John tells us that our humility would say, don't worry, Jesus says, I've got this covered. This isn't surprising him, right? He knew it was coming. Does he know that it surprised us? Does he know that it disrupted us? And yet, we still have a way. We're still trying to come together. Still trying to figure out a way what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. So this is just what the Baptist teaches. You remember always that, that he didn't believe he was worthy not even worthy to untie the, the sandal, uh, the, the thong on his sandal, if you will. And also remember what it took to get him to recognize God. He said, verse 33, oh, I don't have it there. Verse 33, because I already said it. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes the Holy Spirit. And that's where I'll close on right today. That's where I'll close on. He always remembers his human frailty. He always remembers his sinfulness. And unless we do, apostasy will always be a threat to our spiritual vitality. We must continue to advance in God's revelation. John's humility is what makes that possible. I think that's what alarms me the most about the condition of, of believers, especially in this country, because it isn't just the pandemic in this country, it's everything else that has gone on. And like I said, when I don't see a whole lot of humility with Christians, at least Christians who have microphones in front of their faces, which by the way is now everybody who has a phone, I don't see this humility, I don't see this admission of frailty. And I think that's what we need to learn. I think that's what the gospel of John will help us do no matter what happens in the coming months. The other thing I want to leave you with is to remember one thing and one thing only. Jesus knows. Right? He knows. He knows everything. He knows, he knows the conflict. He knows, he knows what we're going through. He knows every step of the end time even if we can't figure it out. He knows all of that. And just, just uh, you know, towards the end of chapter one, it's, it's almost like, like John is getting that across to us. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Right? Where did you get to know me? Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. I have known you forever. I know you. He knows all about Nathaniel. In verse 42, he brought, Andrew brings Simon to Jesus. He, he looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, but I'm going to call you Kephas. Aramaic, which translated into Greek, is Petros or Peter. I'm going to call you Kephas. Jesus knows Peter so well, he gives him a nickname when he meets him. And by the way, that nickname is Rocky. Because the word Peter that's translated from the Aramaic Kephas is Petros, which means little stone. 
He's not a complete rock. He's not a big rock, okay? He's a stone. He's got a rocky heart. Doesn't that describe Peter? You're, you're going to get to know him after this a little bit, but doesn't that describe him a little rocky, right? Stubborn, loud-mouthed, always needing to be first. Jesus already knows him well enough to give him a nickname. John is telling us, Jesus knows. He knows everything that's going on. He knows exactly where we need to be. The message is, is that Jesus knows all about us and yet invites us still to believe. He comes to us with love. He comes to us with concern and that he accepts us. And by the way, the only way that you can ever come to the conclusion that God accepts you as you are who you are is to have the humility and the frailty of John. See, the reason that sometimes we can't believe that we've been forgiven of who we are is because we don't have the frailty of John. We think that we're first and best. But if you need him, then there's no reason not to come to him. If you need him, there is no reason not to come to him. After the call of Nathanael we just read, this occurs in verse 49, Nathanael replies, Rabbi, you are what? You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He just leapt past, he just, he just jumped right past Elijah and the prophet and goes right to the son of God. You are it. Jesus says this to him, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? Remember the same message that he gives Thomas. Do you believe because you saw? You believe because I, I proved this? You believe because of a sign, he says. You believe because of a sign. But you'll see greater things than these. And he said to him very truly, I tell you, you'll see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm even the way that angels can descend to earth and go back and forth. God's will, God's mercy, God's message all comes because Jesus is the way. And so what he's telling Nathaniel is, you saw because of signs. I'm telling you there's a greater way. And the greater way is faith. The greater way is believing simply because I told you, not because I showed you. And in doing so, he lets the second generation know one more time. You don't have to have been there. You don't have to have been first. You can be last. And even if you're last, you're first. Only faith can do that for us. The true Israelite is the one who believes in Jesus not one who has to come to a conclusion because of science. In other words, not just for the first generation. The one thing that matters above all else is a knowing, living, breathing relationship with Jesus. And we often teach that that relationship is our relationship to him. And we forget that the starting point of a relationship with God, with the living God, is that he already loves you. He's already made the effort. He has already made uh, the, the way in order for you to be able to love him. He's already made himself known. In fact, there isn't anything greater. There's no greater revelation coming to make God more known to you. There isn't one, more, there isn't one uh, coming that will be a greater revelation than the word becoming flesh and walking among us and forgiving our sins because of what he will do. You remember what the Baptist said about Jesus? He said, I myself did not what? I didn't know him, which is a shame because they were cousins, right? It's, it's interesting that they were cousins and they didn't meet until that day. They didn't meet until Jesus walks up and John just says, that's him, that's him. Because again, John's been in the wilderness. 
The Father, God the Father, has had John going in and out. He's been in the wilderness. He's been out outside. He hasn't been home. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. I didn't know him, but I came so that you can know him. The only reason I came was so that you could know him. See, and then Jesus adds a little later, talking about the Baptist. He says, truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said the greatest human being that walked this earth was who? Was John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why? Because everyone else who comes after John now gets the opportunity to know Jesus because of what John did. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, how would, you, how would you handle, Tom, how would you handle Jesus saying about you that you're the greatest person to ever walk the planet? How would you handle that? <laughs> I, that definitely makes me first, right? That makes him first and everyone else is second. So we can come to the conclusion that there'll be nobody like Tom in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, hold on a second. Hold on. He was the greatest human. But he was great because he decided to become last instead of first. And because of his ministry, because of what he began, everyone else can get to know him and not have to try to uh, discern some signs to try to recognize whether or not he's Elijah, whether or not he's the prophet, or whether or not maybe, just maybe, he just might be the Holy One of Israel, the Son of God. So anybody else coming after John can be greater because it's possible to know him thanks to the Word become flesh, thanks to him being the Word. The one thing that matters above all else is a true living relationship with Jesus. Without it, anything else serves little purpose. And you have to remember that if you didn't start your relationship with Jesus, if you didn't start with the fundamental fact that God loves you as you are, who you are, and he doesn't love you because you are deciding to follow him. He doesn't love you anymore if you decide to get up and to follow him instead of following John, the Baptist. If you didn't start there, then you need to go back. The only time you need to go back is to go back to realize and remember that God loves you. And Jesus is living proof of that. And even John, the Baptist, was proof of it. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned, saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? Where are you going? So that's a question of two people pondering whether or not they're going to what? Where are you staying? Where are you going? Are we supposed to follow you? I've been with John a long time, and he was first. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with you? And of course, Jesus says what? Come and see. Come on. Don't go back. Whatever's waiting for you, whatever we have to do, we don't have to be stuck. We don't have to be afraid. Jesus says, are you afraid of the future? Come and see. Not sure whether or not you want to believe in me or follow in me? Come and see. So when I see this invitation, I think that this invitation was written just for us today, 2021, midst of a pandemic, our culture in such upheaval and turmoil. I mean, it's, it's a lava field, right? It's a volcano. Jesus says, you want to know what it's like to follow me in a time like this? Come and see. We may not find it in our past. We may not find it in the way things were. And when we get there, we may not like it at first. Jesus says, I got it. I know that. But keep doing what? Come and see. 
So I guess he's telling us, hang in there. Jesus is saying, I've got this. Hang in there. Don't, don't let the old ways pull you back. Don't let you think that just because it's different now that it isn't true, that it isn't right, that it isn't faith. Come and see. It should alleviate all of our fears about moving forward. Amen.